physics quantum in the Netherlands, my home country actually, a tiny country, but strong in physics already a hundred years ago when superconductivity was found in Leiden. And then after the photonic quantum computing lab tour at Quix, we will have QSilver Gibran with the quantum Fourier transform. The next days, also a lot of exciting things are coming up. Prachi, would you like to say something about that? Absolutely. Many of you have seen the quantum journeys of various companies, and you've heard Celia talk about the quantum ecosystem, and you may be asking the question, well, what can I do in this field? How do I make my own company? And to help you answer that question, tomorrow we have the entrepreneurship panel. So how do you go from idea to IPO? And we will be joined by five venture capitalists in this field, people who invested, uh, people like Yan Zheng from InQto, who has invested in every hardware quantum computing there is, Russ Fine, David Dorsey, Bill Payne, and Dean Chung. And, and these are people who invested and supported the quantum ecosystem and helped and supported and invested in companies. So come with your questions of, well, if I want to start my own company, at what stage can I get what kind of funding? What does support from, from the government look like? Um, how do I access capital? Uh, how mature does my technology need to be before I can bring it to market? So come with your questions. Uh, you will hear a great presentation from, from them. And please look up the speakers and the investments in the meantime as well. Uh, after that, on Saturday, this is a mandatory section for all of you who are looking to come to the career fair. So even if it's middle of the night, I do urge you to come uh, because we are going to do a pitch ready session. How do you present yourself to, uh, to prospective employers? Because many of you have amazing resumes, you do great things in the lab, but there's life outside of the lab. And uh, to impress this life outside of the lab, you have to give a very comprehensive overview of your the knowledge, your skills, your interests, and who you are as a person and your personality, and, and present that at the career fair. So the pitch ready session will have two components. The first one is making sure that your CV is ready. And for sample CVs, uh, look in the Discord channel. And then the second component is making sure that you're pitching yourself well, that you're able to present yourself and communicate yourself very effectively. Almost every company today, they not only require to have the right skills, but they also require you to have the right communication skills so that they can put you before, so that you can work well with your colleagues, they can put you before potential customers as well. So make sure you're, you're prepared. And you know one of your assessments for, for being in front of customers is how well you present yourself. And this session on Saturday is going to prepare you for that. So be sure to come and, and get ready for that. And Quix, who is here today, will also be at the career fair on Monday. So you can ask all your questions today to be sure that it's a good fit. And on Monday, you can talk with them to become their new employee. We have two great people from Quicks here at the moment. Caterina Tavellone, Marcella, great having you. Caterina did her studies in physics in Rome and then her PhD in physics in the Netherlands at University of Twente. After that, she became the zeroth employee of Quicks Quantum, uh, a European leading company in photonic quantum computing. And Marcella has been such a great collaborator for us to assist in all processes to make this lab tour happen. And today she will be there again to um, make everything happen to see the lab tour with us today. We will show a video first. Can you tell something about that, Katarina? Yeah, so first of all, hello everyone. It's very, uh, it's very nice to, uh, to be here and to have the opportunity to show you our lab our headquarters in the Netherlands, in Enschede, where we develop indeed integrated photonic uh, technology for quantum computing applications. And we are going to start with a pitch on our technology, so general information on what is the technological background and commercial base of our work. And, and then we are going to have uh, a short vlog to really already have a look inside at, uh, at our facilities. And then we'll be back for a live Q&A session from here in the Netherlands at Quix Quantum. And we welcome everyone again to post all great questions and any question, beginner, advanced, curious on Discord. And we will ask everything to Katarina. 
Lindsay, yeah. you can start the first video. And thank you very much in advance, Marcella and Katharina. OK. Hello, everyone. My name is Caterina Tabaglione, and I am a quantum system engineer at Quix. And today, in this pitch presentation, I'd like to introduce you to our plug-and-play photonic solutions for quantum applications. Let me just start with a brief introduction about Quix. Who is Quix? Well, Quix is a spin-off company of the University of Twente based in the Netherlands. We were founded at the very beginning of 2019 and since then we have grown to an amazing team of nine people. Um, during this presentation, I'd like to discuss three main topics, our technology, our products and what Quix can do for you. So. Our technology is based on silicon nitride waveguides. And thanks to this material platform, we can achieve very low propagation losses, down to 0.1 dB per centimeter, but also low coupling losses that can be brought down to 0.5 dB per facet. This low loss means scalability for us. And this means that we can achieve larger and larger uh, peaks for increasingly complex quantum applications. Another very important property of the material platform that we work with is its wide transparency window that goes from the visible up to the infrared. And this latter property translates into the fact that our peaks are good for all quantums, meaning that we can interface them all with all common single photon sources from the commercially available quantum dots devices as from spiral quantum and candela to the probably most commonly used in academia parametric down converted sources. Now, thanks to these properties, eh, we can offer you our products. Our main product right now is our plug and play quantum photonic processor. If you don't know exactly what a quantum photonic processor is, don't worry. Just think about it as the processing unit of a computer that works with quantum light. You have your input quantum light. This is manipulated hmm, and processed by the quantum photonic processor. And then you get out an output quantum light. And if I have to sketch you the typical setup where you can find a quantum photonic processor in, then I can show you this graph. Your input quantum light is generated by a bunch of single photon sources here on the left, and your output quantum light is detected by a bunch of single photon detectors. Then you have the processor in the middle, in between. Now it turns out that quantum photonic processor is actually something very well known in photonics, that it's namely a linear optical interferometer. So this is your uh, quantum optical quantum computational machine, right? But where do you actually input your commands to this, to this computing device? Well, you do that from a standard laptop that controls the processor. And actually what it does, it controls and sets all the nodes of your interferometer. Now, sources and detectors are already commercially available with very good specs. Now, thanks to our technology, the processor is also available. And this is in fact what we can offer you, our plug and play quantum photonic processor where you have the interferometer surrounded by all this per peripheral um, control system and uh, what we can offer is also the dedicated control software. And the idea is that by this dedicated control software, you can input and program different problems and solve them by just reconfiguring the processor on different settings. And with these systems, we have recently demonstrated the world's largest quantum photonic processor uh, showing high fidelity quantum information processing. And here you see a summary of the results that we have obtained. But 
a plug and play quantum photonic processor is not the only thing that we can offer you. We can offer you also customized solutions. For example, uh, the underlying waveguide structure that controls your uh, ion qubits mm? or on chip single photon sources. Because uh, we have in house all the built in blocks belonging to our silicon nitrate platform. And if you want to know more, you can read our white papers on our website. And this brings me to what Quicks can do for you. Well, in terms of processor, we can get better and get bigger. We want to increase the size of our processors to enable increasingly complex quantum computation. We want to extend our dedicated control software with more features and we want to achieve top hardware requirement for really perfect high very high fidelity operations you can access all of these in many different ways if you're more into quantum computation uh, you might want to acquire directly our processor but we are also very very interested in developing use cases with you for your own uh, applications and last but not least uh, we can really tailor and make it just for you a pick a quantum pick that satisfies all your dreams and with this i would like to thank you for your attention please get in contact with us if you are interested or if you have any questions and you can write us at info at quicks.net thank you very much for your attention Thank you, Katharina. That was a great video. And David already posted your paper on the Discord, 8x8 reconfigurable quantum photonic processor based on silicon nitrate, uh, nitrate waveguides. Everyone can have a look there. In the meantime, Lindsay will start the lab tour. First, a video of the lab, and then we will continue that with Katharina and Marcella being live in the lab and showing more. We have seen Two lab tours already. We had MIT with the big dilution refrigerators. We saw some work in their clean room, uh, some further measurements. We had Princeton with the great optical table. What will be what will the lab at Quantum at Quicks Quantum look like? We will see it now. Thank you for starting, Lindsay. So before we go to the lab, maybe you can tell me something more about the company. So Quix Quantum uh, is a small three-year-old startup. Uh, we've got 13 employees. And we design and, and characterize and sell these photonic quantum processors that are shown in this picture behind us. There's 400 little heaters, which are behind these gold leads, uh, on top of optical waveguides that uh, where the light comes in and goes out. We can do fundamental science where we can solve problems for real companies. So what happens before the quantum experiment? Mikhail, down in the characterization lab, will tell you all about it. Okay, Come let's go. Hi! Hello. <laughs> what are you doing? So over here, we are characterizing our pentamotive photonic processor. So right now, I'm measuring its reconfigurability. That means that I want to study how well I can implement the settings for the transformation of the light that I want to implement. Okay, and what is the difference between this lab, what you're doing, and the other lab? So in this lab we do a classical characterization, which means that we just characterize what's happening on the photonic processor. And then in the other lab we use the photonic processor for performing quantum experiments in the quantum world. What's over here? Can I, can I have a look? Yeah, have a look at yeah? it, please. I see red lights, what is it? So over here we perform our visual inspection of our devices. So we inject red light on the chip and then we can see if there's defects on the waveguides or if there's errors or mistakes in the design. And then if everything looks good and the light goes nicely for the chip, we can select it and we can assemble it into a photonic processor. And then afterwards it goes to the other lab ah, for the quantum experiments. Okay. Well, so if it's perfect, it will go that way. If it's perfect, it will go to the other lab. Ah, okay. And what are those Boxes. These are our devices that we, uh, that we measure and that we then ship to customers. This is our second lab where we do quantum mechanical experiments. Come in. This is where we actually do quantum science. 
And so uh, we want to show you a little bit about uh, how our whole system goes together, uh, not just with, with our devices, but in, as a whole ecosystem. So uh, in this little black device here is where our uh, quantum dot light source is. This is where we generate individual photons to go into the chips that, that Mikhail showed you. Uh, okay. Because without uh, quantum light, uh, we're, we're not doing quantum science. It's not that light, right? It's not that it's light. <laughs> So this, this emits only a single, a single particle of light uh, every time we, we uh, ask it to. And what is the sound I'm hearing? So the sound you're hearing is our refrigerator. And it's not just a normal refrigerator like everything else around here, it's the fancy version. So this fridge goes down to minus 272 degrees um, to keep our detectors cold. Detecting those individual particles of light is, is very difficult. And so we use superconducting detectors, uh, each of which can detect a, a single photon with 80% probability. So what's the point? So if we take our quantum light source and we connect it to our quantum processor and then to our detectors, uh, we get a quantum computer. And with that uh, quantum processor, we can do fundamental science or we can solve problems for real companies. Okay, well thank you Devin for the tour. So I guess we are back live at Quicks Quantum. So hello guys, I'm sorry for this, you know, uh, uh, new <laughs> format of, uh, of this lab tour, but we are, you know, to us in Marcella. And, um, and yeah, this, this, I hope it works best. So Marcella will be filming and I will be talking. So I'm sorry if you will see me always with the phone in my hand, but it is just that you can hear me well. So um, I will I just kindly ask Marlou that if you get questions, please, you know, speak them out. Yes. We are now at our facilities headquarter in, uh, in the Netherlands, in Enschede. And I want you to start uh, with our classical lab. So you have seen uh, from the vlog, um, Michiel working right there. This is actually where we receive our photonic integrated circuits and we start the characterization. And to make you understand the journey of photonic integrated circuits, uh, they start, let's say, like this from just some tiny chip that's in here. Well, this is not that tiny. This is actually our latest model. That's a 20 mode processor. And you see basically this black uh, rectangle that it's in the center. That is our photonic integrated circuits based on silicon nitride waveguide. But then of course, uh, you want to use it and you need then to build this system around that it's basically fiber arrays, these blue bundles, right? that are actually glued to the chip. And then you need some electronics mm, uh, to control your processor, the processor. And this is actually this PCB that you see around. And this is you know, just what we call an assembly. So it comes in these nice boxes. Mm. And then what you have to do, or what we do actually for our customer, we take this and we mount it on one of our uh, control system. And this whole, we call it our quantum photonic processor. You see what I just called the assembly sitting here in the middle. But you see now there is a whole case around it, right? So this is a really a nine inch rack system. It's portable. This is actually, as Marlou mentioned, eh, I was employee number zero of the company, and I basically started uh, working on uh, large-scale reconfigurable photonic integrated circuits for quantum application during my PhD. And to give you an idea of how this system were already a few years ago, four years ago, I packed one old version of the system that you see uh, now on the screen, at the back of my car 
and I drove it to well, actually Oxford at that time, as I was having a collaboration with uh, our current CTO, Yelmer Renema, that at that time was uh, a postdoc in Oxford. So this is really portable. I can, you know, lift it. And what I wanted to show you, it's a bit, you know, the inside of this. So let me go around. We know the where the, I'm just gonna hold my phone here. So we have seen the assembly, but this is actually what goes on underneath. So if Marcella, uh, you know, showed this from the inside, you see that from the PCBs, there is this green uh, plates there. There are these ribbon cables. These are all electrical wires hmm, that connect the chip onto these drivers here, these driver cars. And then these driver cars uh, are collected all to some motherboards, uh, connected uh, uh, then to a power supply that power up our processor. And what you see here, this is actually, uh, just for you to know, this is uh, one of our uh, processor that just came back from one of our customers. So we are now uh, checking it again, if everything works. Um, but on this system, which is really portable, we ship it very far away in the world. You also have a water cooling system. Here you see you know, the tubes going around and this is the reservoir of the water connected then to a pump that circulate water. And why we do that? Because our quantum photonic processors, so are basically a large scale interferometer. Eh? And if you're familiar with optics, you know that to build an interferometer reconfigurable one, you need tunable beam splitters and phase shifters. This is all you need. Hmm? Now, on an optical table, you would need phase stabilization loops. In integrated photonics, you get that for free. Mm? And how do we implement on a, you know, on a fixed structure, this tunability of the beam splitter and the phase shifter? What we use are thermo-optic phase shifters. And maybe uh, you can see it a bit from here if Marcella zoom in a little. So on these tiny chips deposited on top, there is actually some gold. It's the yellow stripes that you see. This is real gold, eh? this is metal. And it's actually not only gold, it's gold and chromium. And what we do thanks to all these electrical wires eh, is to apply some voltage some power across this metal that uh, uh, are on top of the chip. We heat it up and then the heat spread uh, in the depth of the chip, heating then the waveguides. And this changes the optical properties of the waveguide. And to be specific, for the one that are in the field, we change the refractive index of the waveguide. More precisely, the effective refractive index. So the mode of the light that travels through suddenly sees a different uh, effective refractive index. And this means that it's slightly slow down. Hmm? And with that, we can change the relative phases of light beams traveling through the waveguides. And with that, this is why we can achieve uh, then the tunability, the reconfigurability of our processor. And here, what you see here, it's actually um, the version uh, of our processor that we use to demonstrate uh, uh, this year, uh, D20 mode, quantum photonic processor, which is uh, now the uh, largest uh, processor in the world. And uh, this is, as you see, is not that as compact as the one that we shipped uh, to, for example, one of our customer. This is our lab 
uh, equipment, but the idea is the same. And what we do here, it's basically to characterize the response of these processors. And I just want to now to quickly show you something. So I'm going to turn off the light. And then we are going to look from the microscope there. Now it's not very visible, but we have this microscope in here on top of the processor with an infrared camera. And now we are getting the image uh, of the light that goes through our processor on the screen. And what I wanted to show you is how easy it is to use uh, our processor. And also, yeah, you know, because it's a big part of our job, uh, we characterize and uh, control the processor via Python software. This is the usual interface that we work with. Huh? So this is just simple some Python code. Uh, of course, we have created our own library, our, our own library of commands for our quick processors. But this is just loading some settings, say, please perform the measurement. Then the laser is on. We have a fiber switch that switch the input light through all the uh, 20, in this case, inputs. Light is collected, gets in the processor from this fiber array, travels through the processor, get out at the other fiber array at the end, and it is then measured following all this bundle here to a photodiode array. And now I just want to show you what it looks a typical measurement. Uh, it's an easy one, but you know, it gives an idea. So if Marcella can zoom in here, you might see. Huh? I'm sorry for, for some shadow, but this is the best that we could do. So this is the real image of the microscope. So if I move the microscope, right? There is a bit of lag. Oh, is it maybe stuck the image? Sorry, that's the that's the nice thing of the of the live. <laughs> Let me just restart the camera. There it is. Just give me a sec. And we are live. There it is. Okay, so let me just put it maybe back in focus. This is something, yeah, like this. Hope you see it. So this is actually now 1550 uh, CW laser light from a, yeah, it's a actually a SunTech tunable laser going in the processor from here, from this fiber, actually at input six. And then here you see, of course, some smeared light. This is uh, normal somehow. There is uh, some uh, straight light going through the top cladding of the waveguides. But then you see that somehow lights eh, follow some path here and there. And actually, these small features that you see here, let me just zoom in a little. Huh? You see it, right? These are actually these tiny, you know, curves in here and straight and other curves. This is actually the implementation of our tunable beam splitter that are basically Maxander interferometers with a tunable element in it. And now you don't see the tunable element because this is, of course, imaged with an infrared camera. But you have to imagine that you have a tunable uh, piece of metal on top of this straight piece. And now what we do, let me zoom out a little. <laughs> I, I really appreciate the steadiness of Marcella hand. <laughs> She's making a huge effort. Um, so for example, now, if we go on our software interface in here, we can just run our test measurement that says FS, that is basically the fiber switch, please, you know, switch uh, the fiber, the input fiber from one to 20, and please set the processor to a specific unitary transformation namely you set. Now, when I'm going to press play, we have to look at the 
at the image and we will see the light changing. And this is, you know, the reconfiguration of the processor, the light going through it, the measurement, and then at the end, we are gonna get the, the plot of it. So in how, now you see the movement of light. So we are actually changing all the 390 tunable elements on the processor to uh, match the unitary that we wanted to implement. And now it stopped, it's done. And if you look at here, we get directly the plot. Now, this to you might look like, okay, this is just random. Uh, well, this is not random, or let's say it's a nice kind of random. This is uh, a unitary sampled from a high random distributions, hmm? probability distributions, which are very important for uh, photonic uh, quantum computing, especially for non-universal, and uh, namely boson sampling problems. Mm? And these are specific, uh, uh, you know, probability distributions where the uh, the settings of your tunable beam splitters and phase shifter are spread across the entire um, range of tunability. That is, of course, two pi. Mm -hmm. And but these are let's say test really good the quality of your processor. So this is just to give you an idea, and this is one sort of measurement that uh, that we do. Uh, now I'm going to switch on the light again, so we <laughs> come back in the light. Our eyes a bit <laughs> are hurted <laughs> by it. But so this is really uh, what uh, what it's uh, what is basically our quantum photonic processor. Here you see there are some tubes also in here, uh, some some water cooling running, and it's true we work at room temperature, but actually, uh, surprisingly, uh, to make the system more efficient, and I mean uh, the thermo optic. Uh, elements uh, more efficient, we have to work at a slightly higher temperature. So this chip is running at about 40 degrees, uh, 38 to be precise. And we have, you know, some cooling system. So the actual chip is sitting on top of uh, a block of metal as well, which is very conducting. And Underneath this block of metal, there is water running. Uh, and you see here the tubes of the water going in and out on this side and going down to the pump, which is uh, hided underneath the table. And so this is our world record. This is a 20 mode processor. Now, I just want you to actually give you a glimpse into the future, because of course, you know, as I said in the presentation, we want to get better and bigger, which means increasing the fidelity, increasing the performances of the processor, but also the sizes. Why? Because, you know, it's, uh, uh, you might know that in photonics, it's spoken a slightly different language than other quantum technologies. Huh? It's not really, that photons can be seen as qubits. I mean, you can, but you have to find a degree of freedom of the photons that set your two-dimensional base, base, right? So maybe in polarization or in orbital angular momentum or in arrival time, all the sort of choices that you can have. But let's say this is not the most natural choice. What you can then choose for photons is to see them as simple um, harmonic oscillators uh, of the electromagnetic fields. And what then is the name that we have you know, created is to call them Q modes. And this basically means that as many inputs your processor are, as many Q modes it has. And to demonstrate a quantum advantage, so that you can do something with photonics that you wouldn't be able to do with um, classical computer, you need to have a large number 
of Q modes that, well, above and equal and above 250. And this is one of our latest um, product that uh, hasn't come out yet. So this is uh, really, uh, you know, top secret information. No, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, but this is, you know, the next generation. There you have the, the old one, although it's what we actually deliver. It's a compact system that can host up to uh, 400 drivers which is basically the 20 mode processor. This is the new uh, processor of Quix Quantum that can host up to 100 Q modes. Mm -hmm. And you see here, well, this, this is the first design, but yeah, we already <laughs> like it quite a lot. Note the handles because it has to be portable. Uh, we don't like the huge, uh, the huge infrastructure um, uh, of maybe either te other technologies. And what I want to show you is the actual processor here. This is a 52 mode uh, quantum photonic processor. You see here all the gold leads on top going around and here very tiny ones are the actual thermo optic phase shifters that are very uh, actually not visible if i look now at the video which is anyway very hard to look by eye and this is you know our first prototype and we are working even already on the, on the next version but this is basically uh, the the most powerful uh, quantum photonic processor really in the world. And if you are a bit familiar with, uh, you know, with Waver, with integrated photonics, you might recognize that this is uh, basically a Wafer scale processor. Um, and what I want you uh, to, to note, Mm -hmm. Because of course uh, you are student, you and you know you are might be expert already in integrated photonics and in optics, and you might see already, right? So this is already pretty full. Mm -hmm. So how do you scale it up further? Uh, because we say photonics has the most uh, promise for scalability in quantum computing. Let me tell you that now. We are limited actually by the standard technique of placing these gold stripes on top. We have already an alternative, and with that, we can go beyond 100 modes on a wafer. So double. Uh, that's, that's really a huge, a huge step in, uh, in computational power. And so this is our latest and the biggest that we have, we call it, uh, well, oh, this is our little giant or obelix, how we call it. Uh, many of you might be too young to remember the cartoon of Asterix and Obelix, but you can Google it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and this is really, really at, um, eh, at, the, at the edge, at the frontier of the development of uh, photonic integrated circuits. Great. Then I think we have had a look at the uh, classical lab, mm? as you as you see from the tiny assembly here, mounted inside the box, the control system, the processor to you know uh, perform measurement and the characterization. We have seen on the screen a standard procedure that we perform uh, while characterizing this processor, you have seen the, well, one of the uh, actual uh, system that we ship to customers. And we have seen also really the latest, the latest one, which is still in the development phase, but, you know, great promise for it.
And now I think, oh, sorry, I'm not used that. <laughs> I have the camera behind me. Uh, I think we can just have a look at, oh, this is, by the way, you might have seen it in the video. This is our uh, facilities here, our offices. Now a bit empty because of, you know, holiday, uh, summer season, and because in the Netherlands, it's a bit out of the working hour and now. But here is the uh, quantum lab. Uh, I hope you don't hear too much of the background noise. And well, as already in the vlog set, quickly, so this is the place where everything comes together. Mm? We have uh, single photon sources and single photon detectors. And now what you see is that one of our processor is hooked up to the uh, quantum uh, setup. And this is a slightly different version of the 20 mode processor. Why it is different? Well, because this one is compatible with the, um, with the frequency of the quantum dot sources, namely at around 925. Mm -hmm. And so just to uh, give you an idea, uh, here, it's really the core. This inside here, they are sitting the uh, quantum dots. Mm -hmm. So it's just a material based emitter that emits single photons. And maybe it's interesting to to look at this picture that we have actually has a background of our screen. This is a picture taken that shows the inside of the black uh, box that you have seen before. And this is the chip that contains the quantum dots. So these single photon emitters that are grown on the surface. And here you see a fiber, an optical fiber coming down and which is, you know, aligned uh, right and left, uh, <laughs> uh, forth and back to uh, catch up as much as possible the emitted single photon. This fiber then comes out, it goes up, 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 and then it comes out from this right here at the back. Maybe Marcella gets it here you see there is a tiny fiber coming out this fiber then comes inside some uh, other optical uh, systems that uh, perform you know some cleaning of the of the single photons so some filtering and uh, some reshaping and in principle, then after that, uh, because this source basically shoots single photons one after each other, uh, every time we you know, send a pump pulse, uh, then what we can do is to uh, multiplex them. So from a pulse train of photons, you know, that this is, let's say the temporal axis, sorry, I have my phone in my head. This is the temporal axis, right? We get one after each other. We just modify this from time to space. So we get then one photon per port, per channel. And this, the idea is that we have as many channels and many photons, as many channels we have on the processor, right? This now is for a six uh, channels, of course, uh, we can uh, we can increase that, and then the single photons are connected to our processor that is here, sitting here. The single photons come in. You program the processor to perform your quantum algorithm, your quantum information processing task, and then you measure the output of your quantum light with single photon detectors that are all the way here. So they are connected from the processor to the single photon detectors via, you know, long fibers. Um, and then we measure the coincidences of the output. And this is basically what 
uh, what is you know the quantum setup that we have right now, and this is what is called a boson center, and it's a sort of um, well, it's not a sort of it's a type of quantum computing which is non-universal. And let's say, generally speaking, this means that the tasks that you can perform are, let's say, limited. Mm -hmm. um, but this has uh, great, uh, uh, you know, uh, advantages uh, for problems like quantum chemistry and quantum simulations, for example, of molecular transitions. Now, if you really want to go for photonic quantum computing, which means universal, so, you know, has the promise of a qubit based uh, quantum computer, then what you have to do is to slightly modify hmm, uh, what your input quantum like. And with slightly modify, I mean that you don't have to work directly or just with single photons, but what you have to do is to generate uh, entanglement, a highly entangled state with many, between many photons, mm -hmm. and then use that as a resource for your computation. And then measure it via a quantum photonic processor as the one we have. Uh, there in the other lab or here. So this is what we make. And then with, uh, you know, single photon detectors and homodyne detection. And I just, uh, we are running a bit out of time. Um, uh, and I just want to bring the message that now PIX Quantum, eh, historically, we started by working with, uh, on quantum photonic processor. Why? because we are very strong in the technology, uh, in integrated photonic technology. And now we are going to uh, expand our mission uh, from just the processor to a full uh, photonic quantum computer based on the same technology, on silicon nitride technology, really bringing sources and detectors onto the same device so that we can you know, access, make this step from non-universal to universal, and then uh, unlock, hmm? uh, this, is my, this might sound a bit cheesy, but you know, unlock the power of, the, of quantum computing also for photonic systems. So this was actually our, uh, our quantum lab. You might hear the, <laughs> the of the of the refrigerator of the pump and oh let me tell you that indeed also the quantum dots these are uh, uh, at a cryogenic temperature at few kelvin as well as the single photon detectors and the advantage instead of our technology is that as i said it runs at room temperature or even yeah slightly above of that and this will still be true uh, for our uh, universal quantum uh, computer that we want to realize. So if here we are done, I'm sorry for a bit of mess here, but you know, that's a work in progress. Um, I just wanted now to show you a nice animation of, the, um, of our concept of universal quantum computer. So I hope you can see it from the screen. Let me see. So now it's going to restart. There you go. Let me just stop it one second. So this is a sketch of what basically we have already. Yeah? This is, you see, you might recognize you know, the waves that we have seen on the camera in the other lab that I told you that are our tunable beam splitters. And these are just to tell you to uh, mark the uh, thermo optic phase shifters. And these are basically pieces of the processor that we have already, and also this one. But you see that, you know, this is not quite just 
uh, a repeating structure. There are also some new elements. And indeed, this is true because this new um, central piece will actually um, will actually uh, generate what I said before, the highly entangled state, hmm? plus some processing of it. Then if we add sources and detectors, sorry, I'm just uh, stopping, <laughs> stopping the animation so that it's more clear. We have sources on one side and detectors. Sources you might recognize. These are what we call ring resonators that uh, generate squeeze lots if pumped, you know, as designed properly. And the sound is cutting a bit, Katharina. Could you yes? move the phone closer? Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, guys. There we go. I'm so sorry. Yes, so I don't know where you lost me, but um, so here we have the sources, some input light in here that you see as yellow. Hmm? Then it comes in while in the ring resonator, it changes frequency. Huh? This is due to spontaneous four wave mixing process. It generates single photons at a slightly different wavelength. And here is you no. Know, indicated in blue. And then if I restart the, the animation, you see that this blue light that was here has gone through this tunable element crossing each other. And what happens is that basically now we are creating some spatial entanglement of this squeezed light of this quantum light eh? from you know, the light that was in this port with the light that was, for example, in this port here. After that, the spatial entanglement, what happens is what we call time multiplexing uh, for generation of cluster state, which means that these dead dotted lines here are actually delay lines. Here, you see that this blue light has uh, slow down, right? It, it, it's it's uh, slowed down um, by this delay line. And by doing that, we can entangle this squeezed light state with the following one. Well, the one that was generated together with this one just go through. By doing this, we generate a highly entangled state that it's called a cluster state which is basically the resource of your quantum computation. And then this goes on and on. And then what happens here is that we recombine some of the squeezed light with a signal that comes from the original pump laser. And at this last column of a tunable element, we perform the measurement. Hmm? we perform the, uh, the measurement of the quantum state, which is then detected by the detectors here on the right. And these detectors are mostly uh, standard detectors for homodyne detection, so running at room temperature, and for some, let's say, qubit injection, or, or let's say quantum injection, we need, of course, a one pair of a single photon detector. So that runs a bit of a cold temperature. And that's why here there is a, a little snowflake to indicate that it's, you know, that it's a bit cold down there. And this is basically a concept uh, of uh, universal quantum computing uh, for, uh, for photonic systems, which is then comparable with you know standard qubit based uh, quantum computers like you know with superconducting technology or uh, trapped ions, and yeah, this is uh, I just wanted to show you this because this gives you an idea that you know there is a lot of work down the road. We have a winning technology, the world uh, leader um, technology uh, for integrated photonic. 
uh, quantum computing hardware. And we want to fully exploit it to uh, achieve indeed uh, a universal quantum computer. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's all uh, from our side. I would be happy to answer some questions if there are any. This is just another summary slide that we have so that we can just uh, have in the background. Oh, that's me. Hello, guys. Hi, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and uh, yeah, indeed. So this is uh, a summary of what Quicks, of what Quicks uh, does. And uh, I would like to point out um, that you can check our website, quicksquantum.com. So it has changed compared to the, um, to the last information that we had in the pitch. Um, so you see now it's quicksquantum.com. You can find us on the internet and there you'll see also the latest news and the latest paper with the results published on the 20 mode quantum photonic processor, which actually you can find also on the archive directly. And you can, you know, read our white papers on quantum photonic processor on our platform, on our approach, and see what are our, uh, what is our technology uh, about. I hope that this gave you an idea that we are building hmm, the quantum, uh, the quantum future, I would say. So we are really coming from the hardware side. So. If you are hardware oriented or passionate, you know, this is the right place. If you are quantum uh, passionate as well, this is the right place for you. So I hope you enjoyed uh, our lab tour and that I will see you maybe at the career fair and to answer uh, all your questions then. So uh, yeah, I would like to thank you all. And if there are any questions, Marlou, then uh, maybe we can answer some uh, in the few minutes. Or otherwise, well, I would just uh, thank you guys to being watching. We would like to thank you very much to Katarina, Marcella. This was really excellent lab tour. So exciting, so insightful. You explained everything so well. I will field some of the, the Comments from everyone to you. Paper Frog says, in my opinion, this has been one of the best sessions we had so far. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate for this lab tour with beautiful explanation from Dimple. Thank you. Masha, super, super fantastic lab tour. Many thanks. Antonio, Katarina explains everything very well. Shuk, explanation is super. So thank you. Great. Also, there yeah. was a special type of entanglement between you and, the, and everyone on the Discord because there were very good questions and then you answered them right after. So oh, okay, very good. Well, that's uh, what a quantum, quantum entanglement is about, right? So I, I knew already the questions were coming. Now, okay, I'm glad then that uh, I already addressed um, the question. Maybe I can switch off on my camera. So <laughs> hello, everyone. So it has been a pleasure. And uh, as I said, I hope to see you at the career fair for uh, more discussion and more questions then, and to get can, to know you. Also, if you have time, we can still take a few minutes because there are more very exciting questions. Oh, um, sure, definitely. Oh, I will be happy to, yes, shoot it, go. <laughs> great. <Yes. laughs> and one to relate to you, how are only 13 people able to do so much and build so many things? <laughs> but uh, let's continue first about the type of material you choose. Uh, Bacau yep. from France asked why silicon nitride and not gallium nitride, other materials? Yeah, okay, so that's, uh, that's a very good question. So I like to be honest and to give uh, two reasons, because it's not only one. Um, the first one is that um, historically and geographically, hmm, where we are, there is a, a strong ecosystem and there are more than 20 years of experience in growing and fabricating silicon nitride waveguides. And this is, you know, 
it seems stupid, but it is how it is, right? You sometimes start with what you have around. <laughs> and then uh, the seventh reason, which is even more important, is that uh, silicon nitride is um, the, the best platform, it's the most suited platform for uh, uh, photonic quantum computing. And why is that? It's because it offers uh, the largest scalability in terms of, so to scale your system up, you need two things, that your losses stay low because you are dealing with quantum light. So, you know, you need to keep it alive, your single photon alive. So you need extremely low losses, but you also need a large circuit, a dense circuit, right? So many elements. Um, and usually these two things do not go well together for standard platform like silicon on insulator. You can make very dense circuits, but losses are very high. Silica, you can make, you can have super low losses, the lowest, right, on the, on the field. But to make a dense circuit, a functional circuit, right, with many elements, forget it. You will need huge chips, and then you will need to go modular. Silicon nitride sits at the sweet spot between these two properties. Mm -hmm. So offering the lowest losses for the largest uh, complexity of circuits. And this is because, as I said, 20 years of experience, we are very good in tweaking the waveguide cross-section so that is flexible mm, to, uh, you know, to achieve both low loss and high uh, density of circuits. That's fantastic. And it connects to another question right away. Nasser asks, how do you design your processor's architect I imagine you want to have the most flexible architecture when it comes to programming the processor. Yeah, so that's also a good question. Uh, for the processor itself, um, uh, we use um, uh, well-known uh, approaches in the literature that uh, you, you might know as well, uh, and namely is the Clements scheme. So it's basically just an array of single photo, sorry, it's an array of uh, Mach Zender interferometers uh, with a tunable element in it and an external phase shifter. This is your unit cell. Then you take it, you copy and paste it as many times as you can. And that uh, gives you the whole flexibility that you want because each of the tunable elements is tunable across even more than two pi phase shift, even more than, you know, a full circle. So you really can uh, program completely the processor in this case. Very impressive. I thank you very much for the answers and everyone will see you on Monday at the career fair. I will give it to you, Raj, for final words to close this lab tour. To Katrina and also to Marcela, we from Bumidium want to thank you for this fantastic lab tour, but beyond that, for advancing science, technology, engineering in the quantum domain. A lot of our participants who attended live and many more who will be watching it later, they will find it extremely valuable. Yes, there you are, both of you, Katrina <laughs> and Marcela. And from our team, as well as from our audience, we want to thank you for the fantastic job that you did. And you did a great job with the camera work, Marcela. And well, Katrina, your tour, your explanation, your scientific description, it was extremely precise, extremely accurate, and an excellent presentation. And thank you for that. And good luck with everything that you do. We need more yeah. women like you leading science, engineering, and leadership positions. So thank you for that. Thank you guys for having us. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed. Bye-bye. See you Monday. Bye. Bye. Fantastic. We can all take a deep breath now and Jiran will start his video and audio.
I hope you enjoyed it too, Jiran. Thank you for your patience. You actually have another exciting topic coming up too, quantum Fourier transform. So we will make the switch now. Thank you. Yeah, that was indeed really wonderful. Uh, almost makes me wish I was an experimentalist. If it yes. was not for spending long hours in the lab. All right. There are pros and cons to both experimentalists and exactly. theorists. And we exactly. all know each other, and we need to know enough of each other's work to make the teamwork work great. Indeed, for sure. Like, ideally, you want to be both, right? Uh, so that would be the ideal situation. 80 20 rule. <laughs> Quantum Fourier transform. Gibran, take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. So, yeah, we're here today with Quantum Fourier transform. And hopefully, by the end of our session today, um, even if you forget the quantum part in this title over here, um, I hope to communicate uh, where exactly is the Fourier transform coming from. So that's actually my main motivation over here. So we won't actually talk about what may seem like Shor's algorithm or the connection of QFT to Shor's algorithm. That will come next week. Um, but I think it's much more uh, by providing this motivation and this intuition, hopefully the idea is you get a better picture of uh, why and how quantum algorithms work. When do you expect them to work better than classical algorithms? All right, so that's the motivation. And naturally, if you're talking about Fourier transforms, uh, you know, to reuse a modified version of my kind of Q-Brons joke, engineers, physicists, mathematicians, computer scientists, and you can pick up any uh, technical field. All of them use Fourier transforms in some form or other. So uh, you, you've got the discrete Fourier transform classically, you kind of, have an algorithm for it called fast Fourier transform that implemented efficiently. You have lots of uses for it for doing fast polynomial multiplication, image processing, and the list goes on, right? So uh, chances are, if you're doing an undergraduate in a uh, classical uh, quantitative technical field, you've seen Fourier transform in one form or the other already. Our motivation today will be to kind of provide the, a computer science perspective on this. Um, uh, and so the connection here comes from the field of analysis of Boolean functions. I've already shared the references which connects um, lecture notes by Ryan O'Donnell at CMU. And he's got a great set of lecture notes about I think three or four that I've tried to condense here in this presentation. Um, if you want more details, I can, uh, you know, you, you can always go back. I think he has a bunch of YouTube videos for those lectures as well. So you can look at them in detail. Uh, let's start with an example though, first, and we'll see how it connects to what we discussed last session and how it will build up to QFT. So let's assume, you know, how we have been talking about an Oracle encoding a specific Boolean function and then us figuring out what kind of Boolean function or what Boolean function was encoded. Let's say we've got kind of a two bit function encoded in two qubits. Um, the Oracle is encoding this not equal to function. So it's a function that you're computing over two bits. This is the truth table for the function. It evaluates to one exactly when uh, the two input bits are not equal, right? And we would somehow like to figure out whether or not the uh, function actually being encoded was indeed the not equal to function, right? So naturally uh, it wouldn't suffice to query it on just a single input. You would want to uh, compute the function on multiple inputs to figure out whether or not indeed the function that was encoded was the not equal to function. Um, let's quickly work through kind of a simple toy algorithm that would allow us to do this. So if you recall the uh, Oracle definition of computing Boolean functions using these, what would be applied to the zero zero state work out to? Quick memory check of our uh, computation or application of Oracles to input states. So note that I'm already kind of discarding the auxiliary qubit. Very good. It will be just the state zero, zero, the first two qubits. Why, what's happening? There's going to be a minus one to the power of the function computed on the input, in this case, zero, zero, minus one to the f of zero, zero is zero. So you get just zero. Let's not make sure people can choose this for zero. So similarly then, uh, based on that reasoning, this will be minus zero one, this will be minus one zero, and this will be one one, right? And so the generic encoding of this can be written as just minus one, f of x one 
x2, apply to x1, x2, x2 minus x solid state. Right, good. Um, now, this is what our algorithm kind of looks right. That's what has already happened. Uh, rather than kind of applying it on just the basis states, we apply them on a superposition of all the possible inputs. So that would mean that the state at time step, if you call it T2, T let's say, after the oracle, when we had applied Haramar at the beginning, would look like a uniform superposition of the states that we just figured out. So this would look like half zero zero minus zero one minus one zero plus one one, right? Recall our end goal is to figure out via a single measurement whether or not indeed the function that being encoded by this B was indeed the not equal to function, right? So let's move. So there must be some additional step that should happen over here. For all the algorithms that we've seen, uh, for the Deutsch-Schurz algorithm that we saw, we had essentially applied Haramads over here as well. And that's indeed what we'll do over here as well. Uh, the next step is to apply Haramads. What happens? So this 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So there's something slightly off in this picture. We don't necessarily need to add apply Haramad on this one state. Imagine if in, even if you do, nothing really changes. Uh, we are just interested on what's happening on the first two qubits. So this zero will become plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, plus, plus. Uh, sorry, minus, minus over here. So that's the expansion of the state after the oracle to state after the second set of Haramad that's been applied. And as we've seen already in a couple of computations, this really becomes kind of, messy to work with. Uh, we've seen one kind of nice uh, expansion or identity of the Haramad applied to an arbitrary basis state that does indeed simplify this, but let's not apply that identity right away. Let's kind of build towards uh, understanding that identity a bit more. And just like we did at the end of Deutsch's algorithm, we said, hey, you know, let's assume a birdie told us, uh, compute the amplitude in front of zero, zero. Let's say in this case, a birdie told us, hey, just compute the amplitude in front of one, one. So what would the amplitude in front of the state one, one look like? So let's assume we do it kind of, so if we take the, oops, I will highlight this. So let's highlight this this way. If I want to take the input uh, or the entry or contribution coming from the expansion of the plus plus state, to the one one in the final state, it will be a one over square root two times one over square root two, right? Because both the plus states have a plus sign in front of its one state. So you will get a, excuse me, half times one over square root two times one over square root two. And that's the contribution from the plus plus states. Similarly, then from the plus minus state over here, and we are just interested in the expansion of one one from plus will come a positive one over square root two and from the minus state will come a minus one over square root two, right? So you can write this out as minus this one, one over square root two times minus one over square root two, right? So that's the second contribution. The third contribution comes from this minus plus state similar argument, you'll have a minus plus now coming in. Let's highlight that separately. So you'll have a minus times minus one over square root two, one over square root two. Um, third part and finally the last part, so both of them now will be a minus with a minus sign. Let's write them just as is, minus, minus one over square root two, minus one over square root two. People who have been following along, uh, what does this all simplify out to? Roll of drums and the final state is, or the amplitude in front of state one one is, excellent, one. Right, so weird. In deutsch Rosa, uh, for kind of constant functions and balanced functions, we did this kind of analysis that in one case, the amplitude in front of the all zero state was one and never one 
for every other possible for the other class of functions. Now for this not equal to function, it has happened that the amplitude in front of the exactly the one one state is equal to one. So that means this entire expansion without going through all the details, we can write that out as just one one. In other words, uh, you know, we could kind of say that, hey, we did this algorithm, did the, do the measurement at the end over here, and if we get exactly with certainty always the one one state out, we know that the function being applied by the oracle is exactly the state one one, right? Ah, yes, thank you. Uh, this plus sign, right? Thank you. All right, everyone's good. Good, everyone's following along. You identified the sign problem. So what we want to gather is a bit more intuition about what state do we end up with given what kind of function was being encoded over here and why is it that we get some state and not some other state and how does the amplitude distribution work out? Because that's exactly the name of the game here, right? When we're doing quantum, building these quantum algorithms, uh, in, uh, we do amplitude interference and we somehow want to do kind of interference such that the amplitudes work out for the answer that we want in a constructive way. So that's what has happened in this example, but we still don't understand why kind of it has worked out. Let's kind of do one more example, not a full uh, blown example, but uh, for three qubits now. So let's, and this builds to the identity that we've seen to Deutschers already, right? So let's assume you've got just the space state one, one, zero. You apply Harama to all three of these qubits, treat these three bits one, one, zero as your X. Harama applied to each of them individually and actually be uh, minus state, minus state, plus state. You can expand them out. And now you can kind of combine all of them to get something that will be written in superposition in this form. The only thing is that we would like to figure out what would be the sign in front of each of these states, right? So this S will be a bit string of length three. Right, Shorya, correct? The, in the previous example, you'll always get uh, exactly the state one, one, if the function being encoded by B was the not equal to function. And then we'll try to understand why that has happened soon. Um, so now towards that end, Haramad over three qubits, where the three qubits, let's say, were one in the state one, one, zero, will give us a superposition of this form. And we are interested in what's the sign that's going to appear over here. Right, so S is all possible length three bit string. So naturally they kind of look like this. Uh, how do we figure out the sign in front of it? So the sign in front of uh, the case when S will be all zero will be what? There'll be a plus contribution from here, plus contribution from here, plus contribution from here, right? So there'll be, uh, so if S is zero, zero, the sign here, the question mark over here in front will be determined by a plus sign times a plus sign times a plus sign. So it will give me a plus sign. Right. Abdullah, you're definitely one step ahead. Uh, we've done this kind of identity explicitly uh, as kind of a, in general form as well. Uh, but let's kind of finish off this example in front of zero, zero, 001, even though now we are getting a one over here. But the issue here, though, is that the input state on which we applied Haramad had the third qubit set to state zero. So even though when we in the expansion of S, we are thinking that the third qubit has plus one but uh, is one, but there was a plus sign in front of it here. And uh, this was a zero because this was zero over here. So we still get a contribution that looks like plus, plus, plus. And so you get a plus sign in front of all, in front of zero, zero, one as well. What about zero, one, zero? What would the signs look like? What would be the three signs? I know the final sign would be minus, but because you are multiplying what three signs now? Plus, minus, plus, right? Plus, minus, plus. So you get a minus sign. And in this way, you can kind of go through it and then figure out explicitly then what's happening is sign contribution. So we, have, we figured out the sign contribution. But the rule for figuring out the sign contribution was that if, this, if SI is equal to 0, i.e., we are looking at this bit being zero, then it doesn't matter whether the expansion came from the initial, the input bit string being a zero or a one, you would still get 
a plus sign because zero in the expansion of S will always have a plus sign in front of it. So if SI is equal zero, the contribution for that bit in the expansion over here is a plus sign, right? However, when SI equals one, so sorry, this will explain it as well. When SI equals one, i.e. let's say in this case, the sign now is determined by what was the value of XI. If XI is zero, then the sign in front of the one is still a plus. But if SI is one and the, contrib the contribution from X is one as well, as it is over here, as it is over here, then you get a minus sign, right? Great. So you've got a plus over here, you've got a minus over here, and you've got a plus over here. That gives you the gen general kind of rule for figuring out how to build this thing. And we've explicitly built it out uh, for Deutsch already. You can write it out in this form, right? So you first figure out the set of indices i for which I s i equals one, right? So you consider these possibilities. And from these possibilities, you take a minus one contribution for each of the possibilities such that for the same i, x i was equal to one. This you can rewrite in a simpler form as just minus one to the power sigma i. Actually, yeah, let's write it in this way, such that s i equals one and x i, and this summation is done mod two, right? Everyone okay with this uh, notation in terms of how we got this based on our this understanding of what's happening? And then we rewrote this in this form. Okay. This then can be re rewritten also as, it's sufficient to rewrite write it as this, but you can also write it as minus one to the XOR of S of X a slightly new notation, which actually is just equal to what we, a notation that we've used before, minus one to the power S in a product or dot product with S, now with X, right? So XOR is a class of functions such that you're taking XOR of bits XI where S i equals one. Now, if you take this idea and connect it to what we did for the not equal to function, you kind of see the connection, right? So the not equal to function truth table, if you recall, is actually the same as what we also call the parity function, zero, one, one, zero. That was the truth table, right? And the tr in this case, uh, in the previous example that we worked out, we figured out that with probability one, we'll get the state one, one out. So think of this one, one as these two uh, bits S sub i's, right? So what are we picking over here in this power over here? In this power over here, S one is one and S two is one. So this exponent over here, for the case of the example that we've just done is minus one to the X one plus X two. But this x1 plus x2 is exactly the function that we have computed over here in the function that we have computed as well. So it's literally just a phase kickback kind of idea, right? So the function that we have computed is exactly what is in the exponent over here. And this can work now for other choices of s for the same example as well. So imagine if I consider x or 0, 0 of x, x or zero one, sorry, zero one of x, x or one zero of x, and x or one one of x. The function that we've seen as an example is this case, right? Where we've done uh, the parity. Ah, sorry, thank you for identifying the typo. The last inputs are one one here. What would happen now when imagine if the oracle was actually encoding one zero? In that case, 
um, S1 would have been one, S2 would have been zero. And so this over here would also have been exactly minus one to the X1. Again, what occurs on the exponent over here is exactly the function that you would have in applied by the oracle. So in some sense, if you, you treat this as a set of four parity functions of length on length two bit string on two bit strings, on length two bit strings, then these four functions are exactly being kind of identified as a set of possible functions that can occur on the exponent over here, right? So if our task is to distinguish between one of these four possible functions, then the algorithm that we just identified would always allow us to do this with certainty, right? And we can see that in more general terms as well uh, by explicit calculation of something that we did uh, in Deutschoser, but now using a new notation, recall the identity that we had seen in Deutschoser, Haramar applied to an arbitrary bit string of length n gives us this nice superposition where again, now we, rather than just writing minus one to the s dot x, we write this xor of xor sub s of x. So just rather than writing s dot x, the reason for kind of writing this motivation uh, or the motivation for writing it this way is really to understand how what's appearing in the exponent over here is kind of from the class of uh, or a basis of parity functions of length n. And so if you think about parity functions of length n, the string s is essentially allowing you to pick one of those basis parity functions. And that's what would appear over here for a given choice of s. And so if it turns out that the function that you encoded in the Oracle corresponded to exactly one of those uh, parity functions, the output then will be exactly the string S. And we can explicitly kind of see this again over here in generic terms. Uh, X source of S of X has this definition. That definition can be written in this form as well. And this form we know is symmetric but in terms of S and X. So X or of S of X can also be written as X or of X of S, right? So now rather than thinking of applying Harama to X, now you can imagine also that I apply Harama to S, right? And so that can be written in this form where I can still use this X sort of S of X rather than X of S. Now let's assume I apply Harama on both sides such that I will get now what? This side, the Haramads will cancel out. So I get just S equals Harama tensor N, one over square root N, sigma x minus one to the xor of s of x, x, right? So this again gives us a recomputation of the same identity. We are saying that, uh, that we saw in Deutsch Rosa, but now for the class of parity functions. This is the state that we will have after applying our oracle in general. Right, so we, now over here, we didn't really fix which B we were applying. Rather, we just said, hey, if an N full Haramad was applied to the basis state X, which represented the bit string X, we already have computed that that would look like this. However, now assume uh, we are again applying a Haramad. So we are computing this thing. The Haramads cancel out, we get exactly the S state on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you observe that what's happening is that this is exactly the kind of the state that we have after application of the Oracle. And this is usually the next step that we have after applying the Oracle application of the Haramads, right? And so this is then saying exactly the intuition that we built in the last slide, that if the function that we applied in the Oracle was one of the basis parity functions, then with certainty, the output result of my measurement will be exactly the string S such that the string S is identifying the specific parity function that was applied or that was encoded by the Oracle. And that's kind of pretty cool. Right? Um, and I think it's, um, it gives you nicer insight towards what's really happening and which we'll build upon now as we move to PFT.
that these Hadamards and this computation by Hadamard in the beginning and Hadamard at the end can be thought of as now computing in the class of, or in the basis of parity functions. And if it just happens that the function that you computed or uh, by the Oracle was one of the parity functions, then you've got kind of a perfect algorithm to determine which of the parity functions was applied by a single Oracle call. Right. Everyone with me on that intuition? Any questions about this? How did the toy example get amplitude one for one one? Uh, ta, 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 ta. So let me just respond to that question while people kind of also figure that one out, kind of internalize that. Um, so, right, so it was essentially us looking at the expansion of the states uh, over here. And then rather than kind of expanding all of it out, just figuring out, well, if I expanded plus plus, what would be the amplitude in front of the state one one that will come from expanding plus plus? And so we said, well, both of these will be a positive one over square root two contribution. Over here, there will be a positive one over square root two from this plus, but a minus one over square root two from here, and so on and so forth. And then you just kind of expand it out and get it, right? Um, so as Ashley said, somehow getting it. So indeed, kind of the idea is, subtle here, but that subtlety is exactly one of the cool features that's happening over here uh, in terms of understanding uh, the, this general structure of quantum algorithms or class of quantum algorithms that work, right? Um, so we, in, the, in fact, indeed, exactly this intuition is encoded by one of the earlier uh, algorithms that followed Deutsch Schoser, which is called the bernstein wezerani algorithm, where you take exactly this intuition and this observation and note that hey, if this B sub F was exactly one of these oracle of uh, this parity functions, and how do I find out that it is one of these parity functions? Well, I say, well, there will be a bit string S, and wherever S is one, that's the choice, that's the X sub I's that I will be picking up and taking the um, parity of them together. Uh, so we can come back to that slide perhaps towards the end and explicitly do kind of the addition uh, to see how it gets one. Okay. Uh, maybe there's a minus sign that I missed in the initial writing. That's what's messing you up. Uh, all right, so what's happening in this again for verification? This is just uh, kind of a nice summary of all of that we've mentioned as one algorithm. The problem here is if the Oracle being encoded encodes this function. We are, so essentially we're writing the class of parity functions X or sub S of X as exactly S dot X, right? So what we've seen already is that this is the computation that will happen. But f of x is exactly s dot x. So this will be equal to one over square root two to the n sigma x, oops, minus one to the s dot x, x minus, right? And now either you take our intuition from the previous slide or you take the identity that we have seen over here and based on that identity, you figure out that, hey, this will give me exactly the state S with certainty, right? Uh, if I, well, not equal to, if I apply Haramad here. Right? So everyone, okay, so this is again one algorithm that followed Deutsch Schoser, the Bernstein was running problem where they said, hey, look, here's a function. If you promise me that the function encoded by B sub F will be one of these functions, then here's a single Oracle call algorithm that will always allow you to determine which function from this choice of basis functions was being encoded uh, uh, by applying this algorithm. Now you can, the formulation in bernstein wezerani is not necessarily in terms of the basis of parity functions, but rather there they argue that they think of this string S as a magic string that you want to find. And that magic string S is exactly the result of this. And that's also exactly an equivalent formulation and interpretation of the algorithm, right? So based on this, uh, what's kind of the general observation that we can uh, create about how quantum algorithms are working or when do we expect them to do something interesting? Um, right, so this entire procedure that we are now going to identify for finding patterns works like a select function but naturally we would like to be, to be more generic as well rather than, rather than just for parity functions as well, right? So quantum algorithms are not supposed to just work for parity functions indeed. We are hoping later on that it will work for 
um, problem related to shore uh, of integer factorization, although it's not at all obvious uh, what that pattern will be at the moment. But let's kind of summarize, right? So our first step for each of these algorithms is, hey, perform a, create this uniform superposition so you can use uh, this massive parallelism of quantum computers to say, hey, I'm trying all inputs in superposition, right? Next step, get or store our answers in the amplitude. What are the answers? The answers are, right? So there's a function that we need to compute. That's your function f. Using a phase kickback trick, we know of the standard trick of now storing the function in the amplitudes. Now, with a modern day kind of interpretation of how to think of this, this could also be thought of as a machine learning task where you're saying, hey, I'm going to load up my function in the amplitudes. You know, if you're interested in machine learning, think of it as that. So I've loaded up in my phase over here, the function that I wanted to compute. So I've got a uniform superposition now, such that the entries in this vector are exactly the function I wanted to compute on this exponentially many entries. And what's the next step? I want to create some interference. The way we have seen it in um, Deutsch, Jose, and Bernstein was running is, hey, apply Hadamard again. Now, if I apply Hadamard again, I will get some thing that looks like this. And we come again to the basic problem where we have seen that hey, if this f was the parity function, then indeed I will get with certainty exactly the output s for where the s uniquely identifies which class or which one of the parity basis functions was applied by b sub f. However, if we don't have this assumption that this f was the one of the parity functions, it could be some other functions, then what is happening over here? then there is some interference pattern that's still happening and we would like to get a better understanding of that, right? So, um, make superposition of all input states, store answers in the amplitude by the oracle, uh, create interference at step three by again applying the Hadamard. And here now the connection to Fourier transform is that actually the Hadamard transform, uh, the Hadamards that we are applying at the end over here is indeed uh, what's considered the Boolean Fourier transform, right? So if you have considered doing a Fourier transform, but just on input zero one, then applying a Hadamard is exactly the Fourier transform on it. And so the n fold Hadamard does exactly the job for us. So if the pattern that we are looking for in our output is one of the basis XOR functions, then Hadamard tensor n, which is the Boolean Fourier transform, does the job for us exactly. Generalizing it to though will mean that, hey, if what if you're not doing a Boolean Fourier transform, what if you're doing some other transform in, uh, rather than a Boolean Fourier transform, it could be the, the more general Fourier transform, or it could be some other transformation as well. Any such transformation, because it's going to be unitary, will be an orthonormal basis in CN. So let's imagine those vectors to be represented by chi naught, chi one, up till chi n minus one, right? So that would be a uh, notation now that we will uh, use a lot. So we had this data vector of length n in superposition. We apply a certain transformation on it that got us, um, that was made up of these basis vectors. Now think of these basis vectors as essentially identifying for us as the basis of the pattern that we're looking for, right? So when it was the Hadamard transform the, or, or the, um, when we were following it up by the Hadamard transformation later on, uh, the Boolean, uh, the encoding of B sub F, where F was one of the parity functions, you can imagine the column vectors over there as essentially encoding the pattern of the different uh, parity functions. Now, imagine any other pattern determined by an orthonormal basis. You can identify a transformation based on that basis. And then what you would be looking for is to see how your output vector is correlated with, in terms of the standard inner product, with these basis vectors. And so your interference pattern will essentially just get you how well correlated the pattern in your output vector is with each one of these basis vectors. And so that's a generic way of now thinking about quantum algorithms, where even rather than a Fourier transform, you could imagine now that being replaced by any other transformation over here. And the generic idea then is that your quantum algorithm is allowing you for that possibility of checking how your output vector uh, is correlated 
with each one of these basis vectors. And if it, you're lucky and you've identified a basis which nicely matches or is very closely related to the pattern that you want to identify, then chances are your algorithm will end up working very nicely, right? One of the benefits of doing this quantum mechanically, you know, all of this could have been done classically as well. One of the benefits of doing it quantum mechanically is that your data vector of length n was still using just small n qubits, right? So even though you've got this data vector of size capital N, the actual physical memory that you're using is smaller. So there's this obvious benefit in terms of memory. Uh, <clears throat> so this just formalizes what you mentioned over here. Uh, imagine these chi's define a basis, which we, again, so I'll skip over some of the details. Uh, you can go back to Ryan O'Donnell's notes for the details. So we remember we had, defi we had defined a basis in terms of these chi s. These Vectors imagine uh, this base, uh, these additional vectors G imagine are the final output states that we have at the end of our algorithm. Then the output of our algorithm is essentially just going to be correlated in terms of how well this vector G is aligned with the basis vectors chi sub s. Right? And so that's the obvious geometric interpretation you can have. Uh, let's explicitly build the example of how this is happening in the case of Boolean transform for a single Hadamard. So, uh, so imagine we are doing this just for a single qubit again, and we're explicitly building this transformation. These chi's that we had been talking about. So imagine we are building these chi's now for exactly uh, the parity function over a single bit. Note our encoding is in terms of minus one to the power XOR of SX. Right, so you can think of this as also minus one to the s dot x. So now what I want you to think about is that we will define two vectors over here, where the entries will be determined by minus one to the s dot x. Right, so what will be the entry corresponding to, imagine if these are the basis vectors zero and one, that constitutes your x, and you've got your s equal to zero column basis vector and s equal to one uh, column vector. Right, so what will be these two entries? Well, over here, I have just fixed x equal to zero and s equal to zero. And I'm just looking at n equals one, right? Small n equals one, so it's a single qubit. So well, it will be just minus one to the s dot x, where s is zero, x is zero. So this will be just, anyone? Thank you. That's simple, right? Plus one. Same idea, s equals one, x equals zero. As soon as something is zero, it will still be a plus one. Same idea, s is equal to zero, x equals one, this will still be plus one. s equals one, x equals one, so minus one to the one dot one, so that gives you a one. Now, let's just kind of put a one over square root two in front of them to get our, these to be valid quantum states, or also combine these as a basis for transformation, and you note what we get, surprise, surprise, is exactly, perhaps, is exactly the Hadamard transformation. So you somehow, without kind of reference to superposition or plus states or minus states, just by considering the parity function and considering this transformation of this form for a single bit, single qubit, single bit, both would work, you've been able to re-derive what will be the transformation for it. So the Hadamard transform is exactly the transform over the class of parity functions for a single bit. Same idea for two qubits. Imagine we're doing the same thing, minus one to the s dot x for two bits, right? So the first column naturally will be all plus ones. The first row vector will also be all plus ones. Quickly, what will be this entry? Right, so s1 and x1 are zero, but x1 is one. S1 is one as well, so it will be a minus one. Do the same kind of analysis for all the remaining entries, and you can fill, off, uh, fill up all the entries, and you get exactly what Hadamard tends to Hadamard looks like. Right? So this is again kind of now a re-derivation of us saying, uh, imagine we knew nothing about quantum, but we just knew this transformation. 
And based on this transformation, we have been able to recreate what is the corresponding uh, kind of orthogonal basis for it. Hey, it's the Hadamard transform applied to each individual qubit. All right, everyone's good. So that I think is really cool, right? So uh, something kind of implicitly is aligned in terms of the mathematical reasoning, in terms of how we are thinking about Boolean functions, and in terms of how um, kind of superposition works out, right? Haramad times Haramad is the identity matrix, not Haramad tensor Haramad, right? So Haramad tensor Haramad is us applying Haramad on two different qubits. Right? Okay, good. Uh, so now the key step, let's, you know, there's almost now a slight disconnect as well. If you're connecting this to our Monday's lecture, hey, wait a minute, Q silver started with complex numbers. And if I know Fourier transform, Fourier transform also has complex numbers. There's nothing ab uh, about complex numbers here so far. Um, right, indeed. In fact, the Fourier transform that Gibran is introducing is also just talking about Boolean stuff where, you know, when the Fourier transform that we've seen has got these complex numbers in it and it's not Boolean. Uh, so what's the catch? The catch is, well, now, indeed, let's try to imagine we generalize Hadamard's, uh, or the Boolean transform to kind of Zn, where we want to now identify this property that our transformation, this Hadamard transformation satisfies this property. And we make this requirement that the generalize of this transformation over um, um, the Boolean basis, we want to keep this uh, property over Zn as well. So the transformation that we come up with, uh, moving from the Boolean case to the Zn case, we wanted to have this property. Let's just verify that in the Boolean case, indeed, we have this property. Well, chi s of x plus y is exactly minus one to the s dot x plus y. That could be rewritten as minus one to the s dot x, right? And plus s dot y. And that itself is naturally equal to chi s of x times chi s of y. So this property over here is indeed satisfied. Now we make the requirement that, hey, let's try to come up with a generalization of this transformation, uh, the Hanuma transform or the Boole uh, uh, for Booleans to Zn, which still satisfies or maintains this property. So towards that end, let's kind of verify two simple properties. What would have to hold? Chi s of x plus zero what would that simplify out to? Well, that can, if this property is indeed satisfied, that can be rewritten as chi s of x times chi s of zero, right? So that implies what? That chi s of zero equals one for all s. Thank you. Second property we'd like to check. Uh, chi s of x plus x plus x plus x, capital N number of times, right? So that can be written as chi s of x times chi s of x, n number of times. So you could rewrite it as chi s of x to the power n. But this entire thing also can be rewritten as chi s of n times x mod n, right? So n times x mod n will be equal to what? We're doing it mod n and nx is a multiple of n. So you can rewrite this as chi s of zero. Good. But we know already what chi s of zero has to be equal. And we also know what this thing has to equal. So that means chi s of x to the n equals one. Right, and that means what? Hey, that's roots of unity. So the solution then is that chi s of x, when we generalize it to Zn, will look like e to pi i s x over n, right? Where s and x are now can be thought of as integers from zero one up to n minus one. All right, so that's our argument in terms of how omega 
e to pi i over n shows up in this Fourier transform based on our generalization of the standard Boolean transform Hadamard's to Zn. And within Zn, when we ask it to satisfy this kind of property that we knew the Hadamard satisfied, then we get this requirement that these chi sub s of x will look like essentially this roots of unity. Everyone with me? Any questions? So that's kind of cool, right? That's so this observation that we can uh, when we are looking at um, the Boolean trans uh, Hadamard tra uh, kind of Hadamard transforms, uh, they are essentially equivalent to the parity basis. That's kind of cool observation number one. And then generalizing it to Zn, we note that this is how the introduction of complex numbers come into place for the uh, Fourier transform in general, right? So whether it be the discrete Fourier transform classically or our quantum generalization of it, okay? So to kind of sum it up, what our transformation would look like is it will be a bunch of basis vectors in terms of chi naught, chi one, da, 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 da. And right, so now what's happening over here? So when we are doing this kind of bigger transform over Zn, our basis vectors are being determined by this chi naught, chi one up to chi n minus one, where chi s x, s x can be thought of integers mod n, or uh, and then uh, they are just, omega n is just nth root of unity, and you've got this sx index component over here, right? So you can, and people have, and there are lots of generalizations of this to other groups instead of just Zn as well. In fact, uh, there's a whole kind of direction of generalizing Shor's algorithm as well in terms of uh, abelian hidden subgroups, which we won't uh, get a chance to talk about, uh, nor am I prepared to do it. Uh, but that's kind of the observation, right? So you can play around here in lots of different ways. If you're not familiar with roots of unity, check out the pattern of how, roots, uh, how the periodicity shows up in roots of unity. Um, um, so I'll leave the slides as discussion so for you to review or look up the details in the tutorial. Um, our standard Fourier quantum Fourier transform then has this standard familiar looking matrix definition where these entries now are exactly the omegas we've identified as powers of roots of unity that we've identified in the previous calculation. So hopefully all this discussion has led to kind of two things. One, uh, hopefully a better intuition regarding where kind of these vectors are coming from uh, in terms of what kind of basis they're defining, why they are there, and why they end up having complex numbers, right? So this is the first case that we've encountered where necessarily the transform has to be uh, complex. And there are a bunch of uh, facts that you can kind of verify. They are relatively straightforward. Uh, something that we obviously will have to do is for this to be a valid uh, unitary transformation that these column vectors define an orthonormal basis. Uh, for you to play around with this more and get more intuition about powers of unity and how the structure of the QFT matrix look, works out uh, is you take this matrix definition and then can you figure out a nice simple matrix representation for QFT square, right? So imagine this, uh, this is the given description of the quantum Fourier transform. Uh, you can write it also in Dirac notation as such, but now imagine I want to come up with a nice concise representation of QFT squared. Uh, and indeed it has a very nice simple definition, right? So if this looks complicated to you, if you haven't seen this before, or when you go through all of the work, QFT squared definitely has a much simple and nice description. Uh, and in the process, you kind of learn and uh, determine lots of nice uh, simple properties of uh, powers of unity as well. So it's a good recommended exercise for you to do. Um, some simple kind of cases, we observe that for two by two matrices, uh, Hadamard in the quantum Fourier transform that we've defined obviously kind of overlap, they're exactly the same. And then kind of Hadamard tensor Hadamard is not the same thing as the QFT defined for four by four matrices, right? Obviously, because Hadamard and say Hadamard then is us kind of doing a, a single Boolean transform on one qubit and a single Boolean transform on another qubit, whereas a QFT on two qubits would look like this. And that, as we can verify, is not the same thing as Hadamard tensor say Hadamard. Um, kind of, you can generalize it to any uh, kind of number of qubits that you'd like. Okay, one final building block that we need before we can use this now in Shor's algorithm. So we've got kind of this 
relatively complicated looking matrix with some nice structure in there, right? Um, we want to make sure that we can implement this transform efficiently. So if this transform is nice, it has lots of interesting behavior and all good, but if it takes you know, exponentially many resources to implement this transform in terms of single and two qubit transforms or gates, then it's not going to be useful. So we need a proof of construction that hey, here's a construction of implementing a Fourier trans quantum Fourier transform over n qubits efficiently. What would efficiently mean? Uh, that the number of two qubit and one qubit gates that we use are polynomial in terms of n, the number of qubits that we have. And indeed in the lecture, in the tutorial slides that you have, uh, there's given an explicit construction. We won't go over it, I, the breakdown of this, uh, uh, decomposition today, but hopefully we'll do it next week, where we'll go through this construction and explicitly verify that this transform indeed implements the quantum Fourier transform. And when you do the math of it, you can kind of simply do the counting and figure out that order of, if you've got m qubits, then order of m square or quadratic qubits are needed to implement this uh, quantum Fourier transform. So that's really nice. So that means there's a nice efficient implementation of QFT that actually uses very simple gates, right? So it's either kind of uh, phase gates with some specific phase selected or just a Hadamard gate. And then this is kind of the recursive implementation. Uh, we'll expand this out and verify that this indeed does apply the quantum arbitrary uh, quantum Fourier transform over n qubits uh, with slight kind of technical nuance that we'll mention in detail next time. So I won't cover no more content today. We are done for today. Uh, kind of what you should do between now and the next session. There's kind of nearly a week in between. Um, what would really help is if you can kind of read up ahead in the tutorial, uh, phase estimation, order finding, uh, doesn't matter if you understand, don't understand much of it. But what that would help us in is that when we do the presentation next Wednesday, I think, uh, some stuff will click because, hey, you've at least read it once before. And so the calculations perhaps won't seem so archaic or uh, tedious. Um, and that would help you then to get started with the assignments later on uh, faster as well. Note that two of the assignments that you have now moving forward are actually programming assignments, um, i.e. you'll download a notebook file, actually write some code and submit, uh, upload it online. And then an auto grade after sometimes will respond with you know how much credit you got for that. Uh, so it's probably going to be more time consuming than your MCQ submissions. Uh, so you do want to kind of allow for that. Um, um, and keep, with that in mind, I think Sunday is when we have an additional tutorial plan with Saba, who will hopefully uh, kind of uh, ease your way into kind of uh, CERC, uh, which is kind of the Google library for quantum computing. Uh, that's what this QSilver part, uh, Shores part of QSilver is implemented in. Uh, some people find it annoying that, hey, we've been doing Kiskit so far, why not just continue doing Kiskit? I guess one of the design choices here was that people get uh, exposure to different kinds of libraries. So there's part of, uh, you know, first you getting familiar with a new library, and then using that library, kind of getting familiar with these slightly more complicated transforms and algorithms than what we've seen previously. So uh, as you mentioned at the beginning of this week, uh, the kind of content here is slightly more demanding and challenging. So you want to do, uh, you want to allot some time to kind of play around with the stuff. Okay, I'll stop babbling on and on. Uh, questions, queries, concerns, sarcastic remarks. Uh, yes, the slides will be uploaded on Canvas as usual. So I'll hopefully just upload them uh, right after the lecture. As I mentioned, this is a really a very condensed version of a much bigger set of lectures by Ryan O'Donnell. If you look at the references I'd shared, uh, his lecture notes are shared there. Uh, I definitely recommend his lecture notes in general. They give you a very nice computer science perspective, which is different than other lecture notes. Uh, so, uh, because he's kind of a full-blown theoretical computer scientist. Uh, so you get a nice, and hopefully what's, it's kind of clear from this discussion, right? He kind of brought in a perspective to KFT that's missing for most quantum computing texts. Uh, so that's kind of nice. All righty. Malu, I'm done. Thank you, Jibran. Again, as always, I will share a few slides to show the next days. Oops.
Yes, thank you, Gibran. Today was a really exciting day. Both sessions, the virtual lab tour at Quix, photonic quantum computing, amazing, so insightful, so exciting. Thank you all for the great questions that got answered during the session. And on Monday, we will have them again at the career fair. Then Gibran, quantum free transform. Thank you very much. And everyone will keep on learning and working on it the next days. The next days, in addition, we have some other components coming up. First of all, a venture capitalist panel tomorrow from IDEA to IPO, initial public offering. This will be a VC panel focused on quantum. All panelists that we invited are experts in the quantum field. This will be very exciting for the entrepreneurs and investors among you to field your questions to them and Prachi herself will moderate the panel. Second half tomorrow, hackathon introduction. What will be the hackathon like and especially which challenges will we have? There will be the big challenge reveal of the challenges by Deloitte, Continuum, IBM, IQM, Orca Computing, Strangeworks, QWorld also, Romanium also. Very exciting day and we look forward to that. We will stick around tomorrow for some team formation for the hackathon and we'll continue that on Saturday. On Saturday, there will be the career training pitch ready. Araceli from Cureka and Ellen Brody from Startupalooza will be there to polish your pitches to employers and to polish your CVs. And then we have a happy hour and networking to form your perfect hackathon team. On Sunday, further socializing and hackathon team formation. And Monday, the career fair. To point out, we will have Quicks back. We will have Blue Force there that you have encountered before with the dilution refrigerators. Quantum Brilliance will be there with the NV centers and many more companies, actually more than on, are on this poster right now. So be prepared with your pitches, with your CV to impress these employers. Rush, closing words of today's session. You are muted. Excellent. Hello, everyone. We at Womenium hope that you enjoyed today's lab tour with Katrina from Quix Quantum and also the lecture, as always, from Gibran. And if you think that this was exciting, this was good and everything so far has been great. You have no idea what is coming next. As Marlo described, more interesting, more exciting things to come, starting with the venture capitalist and the, also the career panels, and also the career sessions, as well as the hackathon, a lot more coming. So we at Womenium team are excited. We hope that you are too. With that said, it is always great to have you here, and we hope that you are enjoying as much as we are enjoying and learning. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Marlo. Stay tuned. Thank you very much. And we will all see each other tomorrow. Have a great day.